Good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us today for this exciting event, um, Social Housing in Vienna. Guten Abend, it's almost evening in Vienna. Um, so guten Abend to our uh, Viennese colleagues. We're so excited. We've got real um, insider experts with us today uh, from the city of Vienna, from the Municipal Housing Agency, and also from a group who represents affordable housing developers there. Um, so we've got the real inside scoop. We're gonna hear presentations from the three of them, and then we'll welcome our um, executive director, Jessica, um, to join us for a discussion. Um, we're very sad that we can't um, welcome the our Viennese colleagues in person in New York. Um, if any of you follow our best practice work, CHP's best, best practice work, we love to bring colleagues from other places and have great events and chat over bagels and have meetings with um, policymakers and practitioners. Um, this is definitely not the last um, com conversation we'll have about Vienna. We, for our best practice work, we want this to be long-term relationship building with colleagues from other cities. Um, we're, this is in no way a research project that we're delivering. We're exploring uh, social housing in Vienna with all of you alongside you. So, and we'll be writing more about this too. So this is just the beginning of our conversations and our, our connections and hopefully long-term relationship with our Viennese colleagues. In order to try and sort of uh, mirror that interactivity though, where usually you'd be able to chat to them over bagels, um, before an event, please leave your questions um, in the Q&A section. So throughout, throughout this introduction and their presentations, you can be leaving questions in the Q&A uh, section in Zoom, and then we'll bring those questions into the conversation we have after the presentation. So please do that. Um, I just want to thank our sponsors so much um, as we start the event. We you know, usually have a big a, a luncheon for a thousand people, which would be happening next um, next month. Let me just get my next slide up. A little slow. Um, and we're so, so grateful for the amazing organizations that came through to sponsor this webcast series that we're holding throughout the year. Thank you so much. Um, without our usual networking events and everything like that, we're, we're just really, we're so thankful um, for these wonderful groups that uh, are sponsoring the webcast throughout the year. Um, if you would like as an organization to add your name to these luminaries um, who are sponsoring these events, they're happening through the year. So you definitely can um, add your organizational name to these. So please contact Jessica or I or Vivian um, if you'd like to be a sponsor and you could do some introducing of webcasts. We have great CHPC swag. If you want our density is not the problem face masks, come be a sponsor. Um, so please let us know if you'd like to, to add to that. But thank you so, so much. And just a little quick before we start a uh, pitch for some of our other CHPC projects. Last week, we released a, a paper called Housing is Essential, where we set out an argument for exploring how we could add a priority for essential workers in our affordable housing. We obviously owe a huge debt of gratitude to all the essential workers who have kept our city going for the last year and what better way to provide them with stable, high quality housing um, in a neighborhood of their choice. So um, we'll be doing more work on this in the coming weeks, exploring certain avenues that we could potentially take for trying to get a, a essential worker priority in our affordable housing system. Uh, we have a recent op-ed called Ending Brutal Bureaucracy in New York City. We're gonna be doing much more work on this in the coming weeks and months as well. Um, which is really about saying, let's step back and think about the real purpose for all our very complicated administrative bureaucratic processes for helping the most vulnerable reach housing support in our city. Um, the amount of requirements and in-person meetings and um, forms and certificates and everything that needs to be provided for people um, at every step of the way in order to get housing support, we really need to step back and see 
how we could actually put the people who are most vulnerable at the center of those processes. And at a time where some things have been waived due to the pandemic, it's a really useful time to be able to step back and do that. So look out for that in the coming um, weeks and months. Uh, one of our flagship projects over the last few years, a new lens for New York City's housing plan um, continues. This is about stepping back again and, and thinking about what the power of housing policy could be to achieve broader social goals for our city. Um, we've been doing this as a big exploration over the last few years. It continues um, and is a big part of the webcast events we've been doing. So we've had a event on where we, sh we, we released our model housing plan for a housing plan of the city of immigrants. We've had a number of projects uh, of events about a feminist housing plan. Look out for our next release, which is RX for housing, a model housing plan for uh, housing is healthcare and a lot of very exciting events on that. And finally, our next event of our webcast series is on equitable code enforcement. Um, there's a lot of talk about creation of code of laws for equity, but not so much talk about how you can make sure the enforcement of those codes, which is such a mammoth task in a city like New York, could also be have an equitable approach to it. And that can be very difficult, especially in a complaints-based system. So we're really going to be exploring how we can do more equitable code enforcement. Um, we're doing this as a project and it's our next webcast event um, on March 19th. So look out for those um, emails on that. Okay, so this event, Social Housing in Vienna. So again, if any of you follow our CHPC best practice uh, projects, this is certainly not about, hey, look at this cool policy and program that's done in other places, let's do that here. Um, we totally recognize that contexts are very, very different in different cities, different economic contexts, financial contexts, political, social, historical, which all play into how housing policies and programs work. So it's certainly not about taking programs and just using them here. But our approach at CHPC is really about trying to find the insiders, the real experts who know a housing system intimately, and we certainly have that uh, at this event. It's about asking clear research questions. Um, and it's really about pulling out the core components of regulated housing in different places so that they can inspire us where we can really understand how we could tweak, adjust, reform a component of the way that we deliver and operate housing here. So that's, that's really what we're trying to do with best practice events. And that's what we want to do with looking at social housing in Vienna, such a famous rental housing um, system. So with that in mind, the clear research project that we've got, uh, research question for this event is what can we really learn about how other public housing systems work in order to improve public housing conditions in New York? So we've always got an eye towards our overall mission, which is obviously to improve public housing conditions in New York. What can we learn about how public housing is done in other places? What elements can we learn? And for this event, we're also adding another question, which is what can we learn about how affordable housing more on the private affordable housing side is built and operated in other cities? Um, Vienna social housing has these, these two components as well to learn. So these are our, our research questions throughout as we, as we get to talk to the insiders. A little glossary again, every place is very different. It's very hard to compare the, all the annoying housing terminology, um, but we'll go with this, these two very basic ones. Um, municipal housing sort of is similarities with our public housing. So we're thinking of that as the housing that is more um, built, owned and operated by the public sector. And there's certainly a big component of that in Vienna. Um, so that's they're sort of synonymous, the municipal housing and public housing, as you hear their presentations. And then in European terms, social housing is really used as a, an umbrella term for both public housing, so housing much more operated and, and owned by the public sector, and also private affordable housing. And we'll hear both of these components, which are both prominent parts of the Vienna social housing system as a whole. Uh, is the public housing and more of the private affordable, which is a little more like the historic municipal 
public housing sector and then the newer affordable housing um, is done on the by the private sector but we'll hear um, all about that from the from the guests and again as a way as a framework to try and think about how can it can be useful to look at other regulated housing rental housing systems in other places you have to try and pull them apart to see what elements are useful so this is a framework that we we try and use at chpc is like the sort of like eight components of rental systems everywhere and these different components are used as sort of a spectrum for each of them so if we think about it this way, it's far more useful then to see what elements could be useful for us. So for, for the New York system, uh, both for public housing and affordable housing. So there's the length of the regulatory term. There's a spectrum of that in terms of uh, social housing or regulated housing. There's different populations served. Uh, what are the income le levels? How, are new ha how is new housing allocated to people and to whom? calculation of rents, uh, the legal rights of residents as a spectrum in cities around the world of how their regulated housing works, um, the level of resident involvement in decision making, the level of regulation over the developers and operators, how much freedom they have in their activities in their decision making, how much that's restricted by the government, and then the spectrum of private versus public investment, how much in public and private ownership. So if you sort of pull out these eight different components um, and we'll, we'll sort of run these through the, um, you'll hear them sort of each of these being pulled out in the presentations and then also in the conversation, it can be useful then to see, well, oh, this is how we operate these components in New York in our variety of systems. And then how could we maybe change them in order to get better results that we're trying to. When we use this framework uh, before, we did it when we studied public housing in London. This component really popped out for us, resident involvement in decision making. You know, looking at New York's public housing, we have very long regulatory term. We serve a very low income population with our public housing. Rents are based on need. Um, the strong legal rights of residents. So very much on the New York public housing side, we're, we're high on the spectrum of, of all these components. Um, but resident involvement in decision making was very low. And certainly when we looked at London through this framework, as they were transferring their public housing to bring in more private investment and private ownership into their public housing, what they did in London is also then increase the resident involvement in decision making to counteract uh, that shift in one of the other components. And we thought that was when we when we when you pull out the components in this way, we thought that was a very useful thing. Um, to learn more about for New York's public housing. Um, we have a, a lot of this on our website. This is a continued project for us um, of looking at London's public housing is specifically about resident involvement and decision making. So you can read our reports um, on our website, Public Housing Revolution. And we also have a great um, resident sort of decision making toolkit there with like real documents, real memorandums of understanding real contracts that were made with, with making sure that residents become part of the decision-making process when their housing is transferred. So you can see all that um, on our website and we'll, we'll hopefully be doing more of this on Vienna too. So with all that context done, um, I'd like to welcome our special guests, Daniel Glazer, uh, Christian Chantal and Gerald Kussel. Um, Daniel will hear from first, Daniel works at the city of Vienna he works at the Department of Housing um, Promotion um, and he's the chair of the Housing Initiatives um, Advisory Board. Christian Chantal is head of international relations at Inamon, which is a bit more like the municipal housing agency there. So we'll hear more about that. And Gerald Kussel is a researcher at the Austrian Federation of Limited Profit Housing Association. So we'll be talking more about the affordable housing sector um, and Gerald also worked in London, so is a great bridge for all of our work. Um, so with that, I would love to welcome Daniel. Hello, everybody. I will share my screen now, Sarah. So it's fine, you can see it. Perfect. 
Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and also for the invitation to have the possibility to yeah, have the presentation about Vienna's social housing policy today. Uh, as Sarah already mentioned, I work for the city of Vienna since eight years now, uh, and I work for the municipal department for housing promotion. That means we are responsible for housing subsidies, but also for housing benefits, for housing promotion and regulation. And of course, we do the long-term planning of housing construction in Vienna. That means we are uh, dealing with housing demand forecasts. And we also uh, cooperate with the urban planning department in terms of uh, urban development plans and so on. Um, I have only 15 minutes, so uh, I will concentrate only on very few aspects, what I think what are the most important aspects of Vienna's housing policy. Uh, I will start with some facts and figures of Vienna's housing stock and um, about the development uh, of Vienna's housing stock over the last 100 years. Then I will briefly explain one of the main aspects of Vienna's housing policy that we have a strong non-profit sector, and I will also talk a little bit about these advantages of this uh, non-profit sector. Uh, then I will continue with talking a little bit about budget and funding, how we are managing housing subsidies uh, in Vienna, what is our budget, how we um, earn money and for uh, what um, we give money. And finally, uh, I will explain, in my opinion, one of the most important qualities of social housing in Vienna, namely the accessibility for uh, the middle class. Yeah, that means uh, our system has a very broad access. We try to house the many. Yeah, uh, and um, yeah, I will talk about this at the end. Um, yeah, to understand Vienna's social housing policy, I think it's important to know that for almost 100 years, the city of Vienna is very active and plays a very active role in the housing sector. After the First World War, Vienna was ruled by the Social Democrats. It was the period of Red Vienna. Uh, and in 1923, Vienna started its first housing program. Um, in a little bit more than 10 years, about uh, 65,000 flats in more than 350 housing states were built. And on the slide, you can see the George Washington Hof. It's a very typical uh, housing estate from this period. It's a, we call it also super block. Um, uh, and it's really a huge building with, I think, about 100, uh, 1,000 flats. Uh, after the Second World War, Vienna uh, started again a reconstruction program. Uh, and of course, the city itself uh, built uh, public housing and municipal housing. Uh, and until today, about 220,000 apartments are uh, still owned and managed by Wiener Wohnen and my colleague uh, Christian will um, talk about Wiener Bonen and the responsibility and the, um, uh, yeah, the responsibility of Wiener Wohnen later on. But I think it's important to know that uh, a huge part of the housing stock, 220,000 flats, this is about 25% uh, of the total housing stock, is still owned by the city of Vienna and is managed by the city of Vienna. And the second important um, segment of the social housing stock is, uh, as Sarah mentioned before, this affordable housing or subsidized housing. Uh, most of these flats are owned by so-called um, limited profit housing associations. And Gerald, my colleague, 
from this umbrella organization of these limited profit housing associations uh, will explain more about the concept of limited profit. But I think if you have a look at the slide, you can see that the share of social housing, the share of affordable housing is continuously rising in Vienna. Uh, the red uh, part of the column and the light blue part of the column uh, shows the municipal flats and the flats that are owned by this limited profit housing association. And over the last 50 years, this um, social housing stock is continuously rising from 200,000 flats in the 1970s up to more than 400,000 flats today. And this is, uh, of course, for us a very comfortable situation because 40% of the total housing stock are part of the social housing sector or the nonprofit sector. Uh, I think this uh, quality of affordable housing and of having a nonprofit or a limited profit sector is, is very, very important. It is one of the uh, most important qualities of social housing in Vienna because uh, with such an approach of uh, a, a limited profit housing sector, uh, you can reduce the rents, you can make housing affordable, not by reducing the building costs or the qualities and not by compensating the loss of profit from private for uh, profit house builders with subsidies, but uh, simply by the reduction or by the limitation of profit. And I think the, the, the formula on the slide, I think perhaps many of you uh, know this formula is a very, uh, shows a very simple uh, relation or correlation between rent level and expected returns on investment. And it shows, this is an example for, for Vienna, the investment cost in Vienna, only the building costs are about 2,000 euros currently. And if you calculate uh, a project, is that the business model of a non-profit or a limited profit uh, housing developer calculates with a profit of the interest rate of 2.5% and a for-profit investor calculates with 5% of interest rate or even higher. And only this uh, difference make housing affordable or not affordable. On the left side, you can see the rent, the monthly net rent is 4.4 euros per square meter. And on the right side, you can see that the rent is the double. Yeah? The double, uh, if you double the interest rate, you double the net rent. I think you have, you have, this, uh, in, you have to have this in mind uh, if you talk about affordability, I think affordability is very, very strongly related to interest rate and to, to the profit. And this is uh, quite important to understand uh, the social housing system in Vienna. Uh, another very important actor in the social housing sector in the social housing environment in Vienna um, is the Wohnfonds Wien. The Wohnfonds Wien is a city-owned fund, yeah, is controlled and owned by the city. And the Wohnfonds Wien is responsible uh, for land allocation. Uh, usually the Wohnfonds Wien buys land or cooperates with landowners and organizes together with the city planning department all the preparation work that is necessary for, for, the, for a development, for a housing development. And afterwards, uh, the building land is offered to house builders, in most cases to these limited profit housing associations. And we have a really comfortable situation in Vienna because we have about 60 limited profit housing associations in Vienna with a total housing stock of about 180,000 flats. And uh, if the Von von Wien um, offers such a piece of land, a development area to this um, 
private house builders to these private limited profit housing associations, there is a competition, but it's not a competition on, on the price because the price of the land is, is fixed, is limited, but there is a competition on quality. And so uh, this limited profit housing association bring in uh, fully calculated and fully developed projects and a surely uh, chooses the best projects for a certain uh, site. Yeah? And then the city of Vienna, the municipal department for housing promotion gives subsidies to the winning project. And so we have, of course, uh, a limited profit housing sector, but within the sector, there is competition. And this is, I think, very important also for innovation, for the further development of the sector uh, as a whole. Yeah, as I mentioned at the beginning, I will also give you a brief overview uh, about our budget, about our funding. Uh, Vienna, the city of Vienna, every year spends something in between 400 and 500 million euros per year. Uh, from this money, the main our part is for object subsidies, about 300 to 400 million each year we spend directly for uh, building subsidies and only a smaller part, about 100 uh, million, we spend for housing support, for housing benefit. Uh, I think this is very, very important because uh, it's sustainable in a way because you invest in affordable housing and not uh, give money to the uh, tenants and they give this money further to the private house builders. Uh, the concept of our funding schemes is also very uh, focused on, on long-term public loans. Usually uh, uh, we give public loans with an interest rate of 1% and a payback time of 40 years to the uh, investors, to the house builders. Uh, and with the subsidies, it depends um, on the size of the project and on the subsidy schemes in detail. Uh, the subsidies covers something in between 25 and 40% of the investment costs. And this concept of uh, housing subsidies by public loans of course, produce return flows. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the system of social housing in Vienna is now almost 100 years old. And of course, after such a long time, uh, you have also a lot of return flows. And currently we uh, have about 200 million return flows each year and together, with uh, the housing promotion contribution. This is a federal tax that is collected by the uh, Federal Ministry of, of Finance and is given to the, to the provinces. Vienna is not only a city, but also a province. Uh, together with this about 290 million euros, uh, we have really a stable uh, income and we have really uh, a, a lot of enough money to invest and to produce something in between three to 5,000 subsidized flats each year in Vienna. Yeah, um, this is already my last slide now. I will end up with one of the main qualities of Vienna's social housing policy. Social housing in Vienna, as I mentioned before, is open to the middle class. The concept is housing the many. Yeah, that means um, uh, this is, of course, possible in Vienna because we have such a huge share of 40% of social housing. Uh, but of course, it's also part of the DNA of our understanding of the welfare state in Vienna. Uh, and 
about 80% of all the households in Vienna are eligible for social housing because of uh, really generous income limits. And of course, in such a, such a system that is uh, open to the middle class as well, uh, it's important, don't forget the, uh, also have, a, have in mind that not only the middle class should occupy the social housing sector, so that also the low income uh, households have access to this sector. And we uh, try to uh, find a good balance between this uh, aim of social mixture on, one, on the one hand and the aim of social accuracy on the other hand uh, with um, yeah, uh, quotes for quotas for low income household, for young families, for vulnerable groups. So we try to have a broad access to social housing. And then within this broad access, we try to serve uh, different target groups, low income groups with uh, special shares, uh, special quotes, quotas um, uh, yeah, to have uh, both aims in mind. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Um, I hope we can discuss your questions uh, after the other presentation. Thank you very much. Daniel, thank you so much. Um, Christian, please welcome Christian Chantel. He's the head of international relations at Vina Bonen. Hello, everybody from my side. I'll try to share my PowerPoint presentation with you. You should see it now. I hope it works. Um, I'd like to give you a very short overview uh, of municipal housing. In Vienna, uh, I by myself, I'm an employee uh, of Wiener Wohnen. Um, Wiener Wohnen is responsible for the building management of the Viennese municipal housing complexes in Vienna. It's an enterprise of the city of Vienna and with our 4,000 employees, around 3,000 of them work as caretaking staff. We are Europe's largest manager of uh, municipal properties. All together, we look after 1,800 1, housing complexes containing 220,000 apartments more than 5,000 storage rooms and business premises and nearly 50,000 garages and outdoor parking spots. The allocation criteria for the municipal and subsidized departments are very clear defined. You have to have a minimum age of 18. The maximum monthly income must not be more than 3,317 euros after tax for a single person. 4,944 for a two-person household and nearly 6,000 euros for a three-person household. These relatively high income limits, 80% of the Viennese population earn less, as Daniel already mentioned, provide that the middle class also gets access to Vienna's subsidized housing stock. Everybody who wants to move in a public or subsidized apartment must live in Vienna for at least two years on the actual physical address. And you have to have to, uh, to be an Austrian citizen or come from a member state of the European Union, or you have an equivalent status. To get one of the municipal uh, flats or the smart apartment or a subsidized apartment with a procuration fee under 10,000 euros, you also have to fulfill socially orientated allocation criteria. These are overcrowding, which means too many persons in too small a space. Housing need caused by old age, for example, if you need an elevator. Reservation for young Viennese, for couples and individuals below age of 30 without their own apartment. And single parents too have uh, access to this housing segment in case uh, that the interest rate, uh, interest, that, that the interested party does not have a sole maintenance or a condominium when submitting the, uh, when submitting the application. Children living in the same household with a single parent accounting up to the age of 18. If you fulfill these criteria, you receive a priority notice, the so-called Viennese housing ticket, 
which puts you, which puts you on the waiting list. In comparison with other big cities, Vienna still has rather moderate rent prices. The great offer of affordable apartments is still a matter of course in Vienna. To maintain uh, this uh, uh, pleasant situation, even in times when the housing market is under great pressure due to the financial market and the ever increasing population, the city administration invests uh, annually roughly 400 million euros in housing construction and the restoration of older buildings. With this funding budget every year, as Daniel too mentioned already, uh, up to 5,000 good quality affordable apartments are built and over 5,000 apartments refurbished on average. This provides the Viennese with a wide range of good quality affordable apartments. The benchmark rent for a category A municipal apartment is 5.58 euros, exclusively taxes and operating costs. This figure is 4.18 euros for category B and 2.79 euros for a category C apartment. In comparison to the subsidized sector, the rentals on the private market are approximately twice that high. Today, Today, Wiener Wohnen makes a great effort uh, to renovate and modernize its municipal housing apartment according to modern standards and needs. To preserve the historically basic structure of the buildings, Wiener Wohnen works in close coordination with the Monument Protection Agency. Improvements such uh, as the installation of elevators, toilets, modern bathrooms, connection to central or district heating, and improvement of the heat uh, insulation are performed. Thermal energetic residential building renovation, called uh, Tebosan, allows a substantial reduction of energy consumption and of greenhouse gas emissions. A residential building insulated uh, according to the Tebosan directives consumes half as much energy for space heat. The effects are noticeable in a higher quality of life but much lower energy costs for the residents. One great example uh, is the renovation of an apartment building at Kapaunplatz uh, in the 20th district of Vienna. That's the one on the right side of the slides to see. Established in 1952, it contains 740 apartments on 39 staircases, amongst large opening green areas. This housing complex was renovated from 2010 until 2013 with total cost of 36 million euros. Christine, I'm sorry to do, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we can't see your slides. Could you just advance to that one? Okay, I'll try. If you do view as um, view the slideshow, thank you. Do we see it now? I think was it the slide before that was about the the renovation. Huh. Does it work now? You need to share the screen and then do it as view slideshow. Does it work now? We, we see the slides, then you just need to do view slideshow. There's some, mod there's some modernization. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yes. Fine, so I'll go on. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, on, uh, on the example of Kapaunplatz uh, in the 20th century in, uh, district in Vienna. That's the building complex on the right side of, of, of this slide to see. Um, there we um, um, constructed uh, 78 new attic apartments, uh, erected 666 balconies, elevators for each staircase, barrier-free entrances to the staircases, laundries, bicycle storages, and garbage rooms, 
construction of two barrier-free apartments with gardens, regeneration of the outdoor areas, erection of a senior living apartment, including house, uh, including home assistance service, and thermal energy uh, renovation. Besides the overall restoration of housing complexes like this one, which takes place approximately every, four, uh, every 50 years, regularly checks of the buildings are mandatory according to the legal framework conditions. These frameworks define the controlling in diff of different in and outdoor installations in precisely determined cycles. An electricity check uh, has to be done every 10 years. Lightning protection every three to five years. The central gas system every 15 years. The self-containing central heating in individual apartments every year. Fire protection every year and uh, children play playgrounds three times per year. In addition, as owners and caretakers, we carry out general inspections of our residential complexes to check the building conditions. Vienna is the fastest growing city in the German speaking triangle of Germany, Switzerland and Austria. So the demand for affordable housing is constantly high. That is why the city of Vienna decided in 2015 to resume the construction of municipal housing estates. The municipal housing new units are entirely owned and administrated by the municipality. Um, uh, The, the, the budget, uh, which was um, defined for this uh, project, uh, are 25 uh, million euros. The advantage of the municipal housing new include a gross rent of 7.5 uh, euros per square meter, no equity contribution required, no deposit required, an open-ended tenancy agreement, and all flats are assigned by Wiener Wohnen fairly and transparently according to the current location criteria. So that's for now my short introduction for the municipal housing sector of Vienna. I hope it gives you a first impression and a small overview. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Gerald Kussel about new affordable housing, and then we'll all meet for a little chat. All right. I'm um, also going to share my screen. So just give me a second. All right. So can you can everyone see the presentation now? I guess that's that's a yes. Um, so yeah. Thank again. Thanks also for inviting me for this uh, very interesting uh, webcast. Um, We've heard already a lot about uh, the general framework and uh, also about the municipal housing. So I'm going to focus on those elements that uh, we probably haven't heard. Uh, so in, in terms of my role, so I'm, I'm working at, uh, at the limited profit, uh, at the Federation of Limited Profit Housing Associations. Um, so which is, um, going to my first slide, it's basically when you look at uh, the, the tenor distribution in Indiana, uh, limited profit housing associations uh, play a significant role. Um, it is also important to say that they are not only um, have a strong presence in Vienna, but uh, also across the whole country in, in, in Austria. But obviously in Vienna, they, they play um, um, an even more significant role. So when you look at uh, the, the sort of rented uh, sectors in Vienna, you see that about 80% of the population in Vienna live in, in rented housing. Um, and limited profit can be seen as a third sector between the for-profit rented sector and the municipal sector. And uh, Daniel has already explained, I think, quite in detail uh, about that. Um, in terms of um, the setup of, of this sector, so in the, the organization, so we are basically a member-based organization. Uh, we have 185 members. Uh, it's about 50 to 60, I think, of our members based in Vienna. Um, and those organizations are private entities. So they are not owned by the municipality. They are uh, either cooperatives or limited companies. Uh, so I've already mentioned, they, they, they are clear sort of third sector between uh, profit for profit sector and uh, the municipal housing sector. Uh, but I think it's also important to, to mention that they are established and, and trusted partners of the Vienna City Council. Uh, I think they share the vision of providing long-term affordable and secure housing. 
Um, and I think the, the, the element of security of tenure is, is particularly important uh, because they, uh, our members basically only offer uh, permanent tenancies. Um, but it's, it's also interesting that they, they compete in the housing market with uh, for-profit providers, uh, both in terms of um, sort of uh, tenants and, and, uh, and land, but also in terms of subsidization. It is now uh, also possible subsidization goes into all different sectors. So it's a, it's a sector that it's, it's, um, it sits between the for-profit and, and the municipal housing sector. In terms of uh, the, the new completions, um, it's about a quarter to a third of all housing completions uh, in, in Vienna uh, that are built basically by uh, limited profit housing associations. Importantly, it's a, it's a tenure of choice. So it's not, uh, and the, we've heard already a lot about that. It's not a tenure that is only targeted to uh, the lowest income households. It's targeting low and middle income households. And I think uh, that's really important to understand why it's, it's actually really attractive and, and the, the tenure that people want to move into. Um, and it, it, it basically sets, uh, the, it, it guarantees that uh, um, the tenure is a, is a social mixing by default, so there's there's no stigmatization, and um, it's uh, it's a mix of different income groups living in, in that type of housing. Uh, we've also heard already a lot about the, the quality standards, uh, especially when there is a subsidization in terms of public loans. The, the quality standards are actually raised, so um, things that are, would normally be in the building code anyway uh, don't receive additional subsidization. So subsidization is also, also really here, not just to make housing more affordable, but also raise the quality standard. And we've heard already from, from Daniel about those uh, developers competitions that are really important to actually really drive the, 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 the innovation and quality in, in this sector. Um, in terms of the governance, uh, there is a, a, there's actually a, um, a law that sets the rules of how this sector operates. It's called the Limited Profit Housing Act. Uh, and just some of the key elements of, of this housing act is basically the idea of cost-based pricing. So um, limited profit housing associations uh, only charge the costs that are involved in uh, running, financing, uh, managing a housing stock. So they're not allowed to charge anything less, but also not anything more than the, the costs involved. Uh, that produces, and uh, we've seen already a slide uh, in terms of uh, the, the sort of how, how much difference it makes if you just... Uh, calculate the costs and, and don't add a big profit on top of that. Uh, the prices in across the whole country uh, between the limited profit and the for-profit sector are about 20 to 25%, um, especially when you look at the new build sector, uh, Indiana, uh, where pro for-profit rents are actually quite high, uh, the difference can be um, up to 40 or 50%. Uh, having said that about the cost-based pricing, I think it is important to say that there, there is also an element of, uh, of, of surpluses that are part of the business model. So um, we call it the, the revolving fund. Sorry. Um, so basically that means that there are some components and I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, but uh, uh, there's some components uh, within the, the rent calculation that uh, can generate uh, surpluses, but those surpluses, uh, and I think that's the, the most important element, they have to be reinvested uh, continuously. So all the, the surpluses that are generated are not paid out to shareholders, but they stay within the sector and they, they flow back into new construction or renovation. And I think um, the other element is, is really that the difference between for-profit and limited profit providers is the sort of long-term strategic orientation. Um, in the Limited Profit Housing Act, uh, there's even um, uh, a reference to um, things like generational fairness, uh, housing being a long-term investment uh, goal. Um, and I think that really makes a big difference also in terms of the affordability when you have long-term repayment cycles uh, that uh, drive down uh, the cost uh, for, for tenants. Uh, obviously, the, the, the public loans at, low, at a low interest rate also make a big difference. Um, in terms of accountability, I think that's, that's also interesting um, to, to others that uh, limited profit housing associations are accountable to, to the public and to the stakeholders involved. So tenants, company owners, society and the state and there's also a, a, a quite a strict auditing uh, mechanism around those organizations, uh, which basically 
says that every organization, every limited profit housing association is audited annually. Uh, and those reports are actually published uh, on the website uh, of the city council. So people see you know, the sort of balance sheets of those organizations and, and they're accountable to the public. Uh, in terms of financing, uh, so it's, 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 they raise basically capital uh, on both the, the private capital market and uh, receive uh, substantial loans from uh, Vienna City Council. Um, and we've already heard how the difference in the interest rate uh, can make a very big difference on, on the rent calculation. Uh, so that's, that's basically mainly loan finance. So there's not much grant funding uh, involved. And I think that's, that's quite a big difference also to other countries uh, in, in Europe where you have uh, a lot of grant funding. So those loans are then actually repaid and um, uh, come back actually into the public budget. Um, there are also additional grant, there's, there's sometimes additional grant funding available for particularly energy efficient uh, housing developments. Uh, there's also an element which um, I think is quite unique to, to this sector is those tenant equity contributions, which are basically down payments at the beginning of a tenancy. Um, and for those who are not able to afford, because it can be quite a significant uh, upfront payment, for those who are not able to afford that, there are separate uh, loans available uh, that go to those households uh, from the city council at the low interest rate again to, to be able to, uh, to afford that. Uh, just a few words about uh, the sort of asset management because it's, uh, it's part of the, the business model of limited profit housing associations um, and the long-term sort of asset management strategies. Uh, when they collect parts of um, in a new development, so from day one, basically when they uh, start collecting rents, there's a there's a there's a dedicated part of that rent that goes into uh, what we call the renovation and improvement fund. That means that the money that is collected as part of a rent, it's uh, between 0.5 and two euros per square meter, so about 10% uh, of of the rent I would say goes into this fund, and that's can only be used actually for that particular building. So even in times when there's no renovation yet uh, due, uh, those organizations collect uh, funding basically that uh, accumulates over time and then they have the necessary funds to, to do all the renovations that are necessary. Uh, there are also additional public grant funding um, sometimes available from uh, Vienna City Council for uh, any other major re rehabilitation projects um, and I've put here an example of, of one uh, scheme that uh, is being renovated at the moment uh, in Vienna by one of our members, where you can see that uh, the, the focus is not only on, uh, for example, thermal insulation, but as part of this project, uh, there will be roof extensions, there will be photovoltaic panels uh, added on the roof, uh, there will be an e-mobility offer for, for tenants, so that means that there will be electric cars uh, available in, in the neighborhoods that uh, they, can, they can use. And also important tenant engagement. So the whole uh, scheme will be re, uh, regenerated and renovated uh, by actually getting in touch with the tenants and see what they, what they want. Um, just to, to finish up here, uh, the limited profit housing associations have also been mentioned, uh, uh, especially last year in a few reports by the OECD. Um, there's, there's, a, there's currently an, an, a project on affordable housing uh, done by the OECD and uh, we've had the opportunity to present at some of those uh, events and uh, they particularly emphasize uh, the element that I've already mentioned, the, the sort of revolving fund model, meaning that uh, social housing rents are reinvested in the sector, any surpluses generated um, are used for new construction or renovation. Uh, so that, that was, um, there was also a speech by the uh, OECD Secretary, Secretary General Angel Guira and uh, even at um, one of the OECD reports on policy actions for, afford for affordable housing in, in Latvia, uh, there were some recommendations specifically referencing uh, uh, the Austrian model and um, I'm going to finish here. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, to all three speakers. Um, we're going to welcome Jessica Katz to join and we'll have a little conversation.
and we'll bring in some of your questions too. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. We had almost 300 people register today. So house, social housing in Vienna is definitely a hot topic here in New York City. Um, so my first question for the group is, we hear, we hear a lot about housing for the many and housing for the middle class. So if 80% of the Viennese are eligible, does that mean from the poorest of the poor and you're just excluding the richest 20% or is there someone who could be too poor for the social housing? Because we think of social, talk to some of the New Yorkers on the call who may be thinking of social housing as a solution for the very poorest people here in New York City. May I start? Um, yeah, um, social housing is eligible for 80% of the households, yeah? Um, and the, the comfortable situation for us as a city in Vienna is that we have uh, brand new buildings and we have then huge existing buildings. And of course, a municipal flat built in the 19, um, 50s perhaps, yeah, of course is more affordable as a brand new flat um, uh, built from a limited profit housing association uh, in a new urban development area. And so we have uh, different products more or less yeah, for different target groups. But of course, yeah, if you have absolutely no income, if you have, um, uh, you of course you can get a flat, but uh, then of course you are eligible also for housing benefits. And we try to yeah, uh, support uh, low income people, um, also um, unemployed people with housing um, benefits so that they can afford also a very affordable municipal flat, for example. Thank you. Um, May I add something to that? Um, in the municipal sector, we have about um, uh, 12,000 people now on our waiting list. The waiting period is about one and a half year. And uh, when, it's, when it comes to, to, to you, to the specific person on the list, then those have the possibility to choose their apartment uh, from those who are on the market at that uh, quiet moment. So uh, it needs a certain uh, time till the moment you have the possibility, but then it's up to you and, um, uh, and it, it's, it's, not, it not, it's not a question of income or you're higher or it's, is it low, it's just a, a, a matter of, of your, the waiting time. Great, um, so in New York City on any given night, there's about 60,000 homeless people. So a question we heard a lot in the chat is, is there a homelessness problem in Vienna or is that solved by your broad social housing system? Uh, of course, we have homeless people also. I think in comparison to New York, not that much. Uh, but of course, um, homelessness is, is always a problem, is always a challenge. But of course, uh, with 220,000 uh, flats owned by the city of Vienna, uh, of course, it's more easy for the city of Vienna to provide um, flats to homeless people. But of course, with our um, object subsidies, we also, subsid we also give housing subsidies to organizations that are building um, ho homeless dormitories, more or less, yeah? because <clears throat> um, sometimes it's not possible to uh, Re and reintegrate homeless people in a, a normal flat. Yeah, this is something sometimes difficult because a lot of homeless uh, people have uh, problems, uh, problems, um, psychical problems, and so they need uh, also support from from social workers and so on. And this is sometimes in um, homeless hostels uh, more easy. To manage this. 
And may I add something to the, <laughs> once again? Um, we at Winner One and we have an eviction prevention team uh, who, with social workers, and they go to those tenants who uh, didn't pay their rents for a few months, and they try to um, find a solution um, to uh, for for a repayment. And um, in most cases, that works and helps uh, and prevents evictions. Just, just a quick word, maybe from my side, because uh, um, so there's, there's also a few housing first projects. I don't know how familiar people are with that concept that housing is basically, um, particularly to homeless people, is, is provided unconditionally um, at the beginning of uh, uh, people who are faced with homelessness. And there's uh, some of our members uh, or have already worked together with uh, charitable organizations quite successfully, um, either by providing those housing first homes themselves or basically other charitable organizations renting from a housing association um, and, and, uh, and then sort of uh, letting them out. And I think that's been a model that has proved quite successful across many countries. And I think uh, that's, um, yeah, just wanted to mention that that's, that's a model that has always been um, tested in, in Vienna. Great, yeah, that's something that New York City is increasingly um, trying to subscribe to. It was probably more prevalent on the West Coast in the United States, but something that New York is trying to move more into the housing first business. Um, so just in terms of comparing New York City and Vienna, because we New Yorkers are not very good at accepting advice from other places because we have this exceptionalism that gets in our way each time. Um, the population of Vienna right now is about 1.9 million people. So New York City is about four times the size. However, the foreign born population is around 40%, which is roughly equal to the foreign born population in New York City. So, you know, we're different in scale, but similar that way. Can you talk a little bit about the racial and ethnic makeup of Vienna and how that interplays with your social housing system? Who's included, who's excluded? Uh, yeah, so um, there are different ways how to access the social housing sector in Vienna. Uh, there is uh, the Wiener Wohn Ticket. Yeah? Christian um, mentioned this in his uh, presentation. The Wiener Wohn Ticket uh, is um, a kind of uh, registration process. You register on an on a, on a online platform, then you get this ticket and then you are, can apply for, for flats. But for, to get a Wiener Wohn Ticket, yeah, it's necessary to uh, have a permanent resident, residence in Vienna for more than two years. Yeah? So the Wiener Wohn Ticket is not accessible for, um, for migrants uh, moving to the city. Uh, so they have to stay first for two years in Vienna, and then they can apply for uh, this Wohn Ticket. But of course, there are other uh, ways to access the social housing system. I think, Gerald, you can perhaps uh, um, explain how it works for the uh, limited profit housing sector, because the city of Vienna is only managing the allocation of the uh, municipal flats and uh, the allocation of uh, the new built flats, but only of one third of the flats in new buildings. Yeah, so the other two thirds of the flats in new buildings are managed by the limited profit housing associations themselves, and every limited profit housing association has its own uh, rules how they allocate their flats. So, um, uh, of course, sometimes it seems to be that the Wiener Wohn ticket is, is quite uh, under a strict regulation. Uh, but of course, after two years in Vienna, it makes no difference where you were born, yeah, or if you are a member from a, if you are Austrian, if you are from a member state from the European Union, or if you are from a third state, we call it. So uh, after two years for all Viennese inhabitants, 
uh, it's possible to enter the social housing sector. Great. Um, and then how are you just, you get on a wait list and then you wait your turn or is there some prioritization by income or some other factors or is it just the length of time that you've been on the wait list? How is it, how the, each association gets to make its own rules about who's prioritized? So you may be uh, uh, but Maybe just briefly about uh, the way it works in the limited profit housing sector. So Daniel has already said, uh, when housing associations build with uh, subsidies, then the, the city council has the allocation rights uh, for about a third or half uh, of, uh, of the new flats. Um, and the other half is, is basically allocated by uh, housing associations themselves. So they have waiting lists uh, when there's a new development. Uh, there's a, a point when people can actually register their interest uh, on the websites of the individual housing associations. Uh, and that's uh, administered by those organizations independently. So it is a, a I would say a first come first serve basis, but uh, they also have their own sort of priorities uh, and, uh, and they allocate according to that. Great. Um, so this project got started with CHPC doing work around London in particular around the tenant decision making in the UK process, which is really lacking here that we're trying to incorporate more. So can you tell us a little bit about resident decision making or is there a tenant association? What is what is the involvement of residents along the way in any of these housing choices? Um, I think it depends very much on the housing association. I think, uh, especially in the last 10, 15 years, uh, a lot of um, housing associations uh, tried out some um, projects with participation before the tenants move in. Uh, and of course, if the tenants are moved in, they have the right to, to establish a, um, a tenant advisory board, something like this, yeah, so they are, they can be involved in, in, in the decision making in how the, 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 the housing estate is managed, but uh, our experience is also that only a very little amount uh, of the inhabitants are interested in such uh, projects with participation with in the tenants involvement. I think uh, most of the tenants in Vienna have the attitude that uh, if everything is fine, uh, I don't have to participate. Yeah? I, I pay my rent. If the staircase is, is clean, that's, that's fine for me. Uh, I, I'm interested in a good relationship with my neighbors, but I'm not so much interested in spending my spare time with them. Of course, um, in, in especially in new buildings, uh, housing associations uh, try to offer uh, community facilities to the inhabitants um, for um, community laundries, uh, community um, roof gardens. Uh, of course, uh, these facilities are used by some of the tenants but I think a lot of tenants have the attitude, I, this is my flat and I'm, I'm lived there with my family and I have my friends somewhere else in the city and I'm not so interested in, yeah, in uh, socializing with the neighborhood. Yeah, maybe yeah, just a word cool. on that. <laughs> Go on, Gerard. No, thank you. Um, I think that the architecture is plays quite an important role, especially in Vienna, where you have uh, most developments are sort of multi-story apartment blocks, and, uh, and there is a big emphasis on communal rooms and facilities. I think that's when you look at uh, and you compare it internationally. I think that that stands actually out that you have uh, uh, in most developments you have play areas, you have communal facilities. Um, I mean, there's also, I've mentioned uh, in my presentation that uh, half of our members are actually cooperatives. Uh, doesn't always mean that they're very small cooperatives and sort of bottom up uh, organizations because of some, most of them actually have a long history dating back more than 100 years. So they have become quite established big organizations, but uh, it means also that um, 
tenants are also members of the cooperative and they have a, a say in what uh, the decision making in the organization. And maybe another thing that uh, is a sort of new development that um, is a sort of co-housing developments, uh, we call them Baugruppen, um, where people get together and they build a new uh, or design a new project and and then a housing association would often act as a, as a developer and uh, basically the, the organization who has all the know-how in the building expertise uh, and the co-housing group uh, who might not be able to do all the sort of technical legal and financial framework around that uh, they are helped by housing associations um, so that's that's also another I think element that uh, has taken up taken off uh, quite significantly in Vienna that uh, people get involved um, so on to a question about building new housing. When you're building new social housing in Vienna, how do you decide where it's built? How do you acquire the land? Is it, what's the process around making decisions around new housing? Yeah, um, I think find affordable land for affordable housing is really a challenge. Yeah? And so um, I think in Vienna it works because all the different entities and bodies work together. I mentioned before the Wohn von Wien, the Wohn von Wien, this public fund controlled by the city of Vienna, uh, has a very long term perspective and has a lot of land reserves, yeah, everywhere in Vienna. Of course, not in the historical center, but uh, the last 10 years, a lot of uh, brownfield, brownfield development um, um, was, was going on, yeah, especially on former railway station. And uh, as a as a important player also on the at the, at the land market, the Wohn von Wien was able to cooperate with this. Uh, landowners to develop together, uh, to prepare the development together with the city, uh, plan with the urban planning department and the landowners. And so it's a, a, a ongoing process, the allocation of new affordable land and the advantage of the Wohn von Wien as a public fund is that um, the Wohn von Wien usually has a much more long-term perspective. So for the Wohn for Wien, it's possible to buy a piece of land with agricultural use somewhere in the, in this, in the, in the outskirts, um, in the periphery, and, and then develop this land 10 years later. Yeah? No private investor in Vienna has this strengthness to uh, buy land today and develop it in 10 or 15 years. Yeah? And with this long-term perspective, uh, uh, the, the, the Wohn von Wien can compete on the, on the um, land market, uh, can compete with these private and for-profit investors. Uh, and yeah, and so of course uh, it's hard. Of course you have to use all your instruments yeah, you have as a city. We have this instrument of the zoning plan. We have the instrument of the building code. We have the instrument of this uh, public fund that is responsible for the allocation of uh, affordable land for affordable housing, the Wohn von Wien. We have our subsidies. We have the Limited Profit Housing Association. And as Gerald mentioned before, uh, they can, uh, uh, make a little surplus and they have to reinvest the surplus in the sector, in new buildings and also in allocation of new building land. Yeah? And so also the limited profit housing associations in Vienna uh, owns uh, land all over the city. Yeah? And so they can bring this in development in a, in, in continuously. Yeah? Um, so let's talk about the location of most of your social housing in terms of the fabric of the city itself. I think one of the things that New York City has done well historically is we do have quite a bit of our public housing stock in core central New York City neighborhoods, as opposed to a city like Toronto or a Paris where you really see the core of the city and then these kind of high towers on the periphery where they put most of their low income housing. So where does Vienna fall in that spectrum?
Christian May, you will uh, yeah, add. I, I, I'll do. Um, well, uh, over the last 100 years, uh, uh, the municipal uh, housing complexes were built nearly everywhere, even in the very heart of our city, nearby the St. Stephen's Church, or in the villa areas in the in the northeast and southeast of our city, you will find many, many big uh, municipal housing complexes. So they are spread all over uh, Vienna, and that's... Uh, one main assets, I think, for, of the city of Vienna, that we have uh, this social mix, not just within our apartments, but within the complete city. Yeah, I think that's something that we really found in our research with London also that really recommended it because at some point, something like one in three Londoners were living in public housing. It really reduced the stigma and the sort of the way that we other people in affordable housing and then that really makes it mainstream so that when you're trying to build new housing, it doesn't create the same type of controversy or stigma and is seen to benefit everybody in a deeper way um, than what we sometimes see here in New York City. Um, in the wake of COVID, we have really been economically devastated here in New York. Um, and it's really making renters and homeowners alike struggle. So what has been the impact on COVID in Vienna and social housing? What is the social safety net that's available to Viennese residents um, in the wake of this terrible economic crisis? Well, in the municipal housing sector, we uh, stopped evictions. Uh, we tried to find the uh, ways by individual subsidies to help those who are in social need because they lost their jobs. Um, I have, we don't have an, 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 a final solution for all these problems which will come up to, uh, uh, but will uh, for sure will try to help everybody who, who is in need and, and I don't think uh, the city of Vienna and especially the um, uh, uh, um, housing counselor will take care that uh, most people um, can uh, leave, uh, can uh, uh, stay in their homes. Yeah, I think many experts in Vienna or in Austria say that we are still um, that there's still a silence before the storm. Yeah, because uh, a lot of um, people there get unemployed the last um, year, uh, still now um, get um, money from the state, they, uh, they are secure, yeah? but I think perhaps um, in summer or perhaps in, in, in autumn, uh, if all these um, social security payments, yeah, like um, um, unemployment aid, um, short um, uh, Kurzarbeit, we, we call it, yeah. Uh, if, if they run out, yeah, perhaps then uh, it, be, it will become more difficult also for, for us uh, in the city of Vienna and especially in the housing sector. Uh, until now, we also are responsible in the municipal department for housing promotion for the housing benefit. Until now, we see only a very, very little increase in um, applications for housing benefits. So it's, it's not, not that um, problematic until now. Yeah? Maybe just, just quickly on that, um, because we, we've recently done a survey uh, with, with our members and uh, we've asked them basically if, if they've seen an increase in uh, uh, rent deferrals or people asking for uh, paying the rent at a later time. Uh, and about half have uh, said they have seen a significant increase uh, in, in their tenants basically asking um, to postpone rent payments. Um, but having said that, I think um, what we see at the moment, I mean, um, I think as Daniel said, it's, it's probably dependent also on development in the house, in the labor market. But I think uh, in, in general, uh, at this time, we can see that the, the resilience also of, uh, of, of this whole sector is that people in the past probably have been more easily able to potentially have savings and um, um, not be able to live at the, at the sort of push uh, and have you know very expensive rents where uh, from one day or from one month to the other one, uh, you wouldn't be able to, to pay your rent anymore. So I think 
you can see that in the long term, uh, those sort of affordable rents uh, also allow households to maneuver probably a bit more easy to navigate through those difficult times. But uh, yeah, obviously, we will definitely see a, an increase in, um, in, in uh, rent arrears. I think that's for sure. Yeah. Um, speaking of savings, that's a great segue. The question of a down payment, I think, is pretty surprising to a New York audience that doesn't think about a down payment in rental housing. So talk a little bit about the down payment, what it's used for, why you need it, and how much is it? So the down payment is, is basically part of, uh, when you think about the financing, uh, instead of uh, taking a public loan or a loan from a bank, uh, housing associations draw on basically the, the money that uh, they can um, get from tenants at the beginning. They get back tenants when they move out of, uh, of their home, they get back that money. But it also means, obviously, uh, it can be a barrier for, for some very low income households. Uh, but as I've, as I've mentioned, there are a special uh, loans directed to those households uh, to assist them uh, with, with those payments. Um, and also, it also means when uh, tenants make this down payment that uh, the rent is actually lower because they do not, uh, as part of the cost rent regime, they do not need to pay any interest on that uh, part of, uh, of the uh, house scheme is financed. So it's a bit of a trade off uh, between um, a barrier and at the same time actually making housing. Uh, more affordable in terms of not having to pay any interest on, on that sum of uh, the housing finance. Okay. So in how much is it in terms of how many months of rent are you putting down up front? So it's, it, it varies. It can be from, uh, it's, it's usually calculated per square meter. So it's between 50 euros per square meter to, um, can be up to 300 euros per square meter. So it can be, uh, I would say between, let's say 8,000 to sometimes even 30,000 euros uh, upfront payment at the beginning of a tenancy. So that's uh, obviously quite a significant amount of money. Uh, it also means that tenants who pay more than, for example, 70 euros per square meter, they acquire the right to buy after five years uh, or it used to be after 10 years. So uh, tenants who pay a higher amount then have, later on have the, the right to, to buy this, this property. Great. And then you had a great slide earlier. What percentage of the financing is covered by those down payments? Um, I think it varies. It can be between five and ten percent. I would say. But that's still substantial that the tenants themselves are paying for that. So that would make a big difference. I mean yeah. that there is that there are also uh, especially in um, there are sort of different schemes and and uh, some schemes uh, you don't have any down down payment at all. So uh, that's the the so called. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, Chris and Daniel might know more about that. The smart homes uh, where you have a lower rent and you don't have any down payment uh, at the beginning of your tenancy. Um, so the biggest struggle that we have with our public housing sector here in New York right now is housing quality. We built it you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago and it's really starting to fall apart and the, the funding has just not been available to maintain those homes in the way that we can be proud of. So talk a little bit about how you maintain housing quality in Viennese social housing. Maybe should I start briefly? Because um, I've, I've mentioned the, there is this uh, element in, in, in the rent that basically covers uh, renovations. Um, so housing associations from day one, when a tenant, a new household moves in, they collect uh, a dedicated part of the rent goes into this renovation fund. So if at some point, uh, and usually renovation cycles are about 30 years um, when there's major renovations due, but also before that, obviously, uh, these funds can then be used uh, to, to make uh, major renovations. And there is additional public, uh, often grant funding available for those renovations. Yeah, great. Um, all right, so we just have a couple minutes left. So I'm hearing a lot about residents, both in the rent structure, contributing to the ongoing quality, as well as using the down payment to reduce the costs. Um, just at the in a couple minutes that we have left, we really think of Vienna as this gold standard that is unattainable for New York City, and we're kind of um, deify the work that you do. Um, so tell us a little bit about, but it can't all be roses. So tell us a little bit about what your struggles are in the housing sector. Well, in our housing sector, 
the municipal housing sector, it's um, quite a challenge to uh, keep up our housing complexes uh, in a um, uh, in a, at the highest standards. Uh, to um, um, retrofit them, um, uh, to uh, uh, bring them up to the latest standards. Uh, these are investments which are not always can be financed by the savings uh, which we have on these buildings. So sometimes we have to um, take bank loans which, which have to be paid back uh, from the tenants over a period of about 10 years. And that is a difficulty for some of the tenants, but uh, fortunately, there are subsidies of the city of Vienna who help those who can't afford those uh, additional uh, uh, finances. Well, we are we have a wash in questions, both in the Q&A and the chat, which we are not gonna get to today, but we will keep those in mind as we continue our research um, so it's been really helpful for our for, to hear from our audience about what you want to know more about in Vienna social housing. Thank you so much to Gerald and Christian and Daniel for joining us here today and for all of our audience. And of course, our tremendous sponsors who are making this possible. Um, and to be continued, we're going to continue having this conversation and learning more about how social housing in Vienna around the world and figuring out what we will be able to uh, learn from and bring home to New York City, where we sorely, sorely need your help and advice. So thank you again so much to everybody. Thank you to our participants. And we will post this uh, conversation on our website in the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.